good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Trends and Best Practices in Global Drug Product Labeling Management, Taking Control of the End-to-End -end Labeling Process. My name is Yasmin Mufti, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and includes a Q&A session with our speakers. It is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation. Use the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message through this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and the presentation slides will advance automatically. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Cypheromix, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Cypheromix Corporation collaborates life science organizations through the entire product development lifecycle to provide a full range of services from pre to post marketing. Their labeling, their labeling managed services compri sorry, comprises people expertise, streamlined processes, and technology that helps clients achieve quality, compliance, and efficiency. At this point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today's event, Bindu Narang, Director of Scientific Writing and Regulatory Affairs at Cyformix. Bindu Narang oversees Cyformix's scientific writing and regulatory affairs practice, she is a seasoned pharmaceutical professional and has over 25 years of experience working both with pharmaceutical companies and CROs. Bindu has set up and worked closely with publishing groups using ECTD submission tools and software. Prior to Cypermix, Bindu headed up the Mumbai, the Mumbai Regulatory Writing Group for Pfizer, where she helped establish a matrix regulatory writing organization. Bindu holds a master's degree in pharmaceutical science, and she presents at conferences and organizations around the world on medical writing, global labeling management, and document reviews. Our next speaker for today is Boris Jankowski, Director of Solutions Architecture at Cyformix. Boris joined Cyformix Corporation in January 2014 as Director and Global Head, Solution Architecture Services. In his role, Boris is responsible for the corporate solutions offering strategy, development, and evolution, including global labeling. Boris and his team engage directly with existing and prospective clients for the, for the design of end-to-end -end solutions and alternative operating models within the regulatory affairs, pharmacovigilance, and clinical development domain. Boris joined Cypheromix went from Amgen, where he supported the RA and PV organizations in various functional and leadership roles with global labeling, benefit risk communications, oper operational excellence, and external strategy functions. Prior to Amgen, Boris spent time as a scientist working within the industry and academia with, with a focus on analytical chemistry, protein biochemistry, and metabolomics. Boris holds an MS in chemistry from California State University, Fullerton, and an MBA from Pepperdine University. And our next speaker for today's event is Craig Troutman, CEO at Integras. As the CEO of Integras, Craig's primary responsibility is driving the strategic initiatives, plans, and policies established by the Integras Board of Directors while overseeing the client-centric approach to sales, service, and support that, that are the company's hallmarks. His day-to-day -day activities consist of a varying slate of priorities, including managing business development, determining organizational direction, making key project decisions, interacting with human resources, and accounting. Currently, Craig serves as a member of the SPL leadership team and is also a member of the technical process, excuse me, the technical process and generic subteam. And now, without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to Bindu. And uh, Bindu, you may begin when ready. Uh, 
Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on trends in global label management. Uh, today's objectives are to share with you what is driving labeling complexity in terms of internal pressures such as global expansion and evolving global health authority expectations. We will also share what the future looks like with regards to seamless integration of the end-to-end -end labeling process from signal to package, coupled with external services and technology enablers. And finally, we would like to share how to assess the overall performance and quality of the labeling process. Um, I'd like to make this as relevant for you as possible. And to that end, here's an audience poll. Um, over to Yasmin to run that. Thanks. Thank you, Bindu. We do have a poll question. And uh, you can vote on this in real time by clicking on your screen. The polling question for today is, how many of you work in regulatory affairs, safety, quality, IT, or other? And you can check all that apply. The question, again, is how many of you work in regulatory affairs, safety, quality, IT, or other? It looks like most of you have voted. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results with you. And there we have it. But we have 60% for regulatory affairs, 9% for safety, 17% for quality, 2% in IT, and 47% voted other. And uh, Bindu, back to you. Thanks, Yasmin. That was an interesting revolution. Um, so I, I would certainly be interested in what the other 47% are. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that 60% are in regular affairs, and hopefully labeling is one of your key functions. Um, so right now my task is to outline for you some of the challenges faced by global labeling teams. I hope these do resonate with you. And uh, I would love to hear if you agree or have other challenges to speak to. Um, drug product labeling is continuing to grow both in complexity and strategic importance. It is a key mechanism for communication of the benefit risk to healthcare professionals and patients. Um, that companies not only have to ensure a harmony of messaging from the core data sheets to local prescribing information, but they also have to track and document the implementation of labeling changes and any local variants. This calls for operational leadership. You need to drive accuracy, precision, and efficient execution. Uh, what is also critical is knowledge and application of worldwide regulations. We have found it very useful to maintain a knowledge repository, which is constantly updated by our experts. Um, and uh, they, they constantly surf regulatory sites and have alerts to note when something changes. Uh, it's also important to have hands and feet on the ground to be able to contribute to the submission strategy and to, to negotiate those all important health authority labeling interactions to ensure that the company's position is not um, varied from by a great deal. Um, so what is driving complexity and workloads in labeling? Uh, there are several factors. I list the three biggies here, geographic expansion, portfolio growth, and increasing health authority focus. So entering into newer markets has become an imperative to fuel growth and consumption. And with that, labeling teams need to deal with different local regulations. Even more importantly, they need to deal with different regulatory agencies who are evolving in maturity. Their processes may not be well defined. Often they will pose unusual demands. For example, despite the global directive that local labels be derived from the core data sheet, some countries will insist on using the USPI as a base. Other regulators will allow you to update labels only so many times so that local country offices will wait and update their labels only after several CDS 
updates. This is quite frustrating for the global teams, but these are some of the issues we have to deal with. Um, portfolio growth is another compounding factor. Some of our clients seem to be in an inorganic growth mode all the time. That couples with new molecules and products can increase workloads for the labeling teams manifold. I'm sure that most of you would have experienced projects where legacy formats need conversion into the current company format. And as if that's not enough, regulations change. The EU wanted to implement QRD templates. USFDA now wants us to have labels conform to the PLR. Interesting times and work. And one of our recent projects actually implements the conversion of old labels to the PLR format. The new regulations are only proof that there is increased focus by the health agencies on labeling. This is a key indicator for patient safety. In fact, we find that there are a significant number of findings during inspections relate to the product label. There seems to be increasing pressure by health authorities to demonstrate overall performance, quality, and compliance of the end-to-end -end labeling process. Over to another audience poll to see if um, some of the challenges resonated with you. Uh, Yasmin? Thank you, Bindu. Uh, yes, our next polling question, which you can also uh, vote on in real time by clicking on your screens. The question is, rate your biggest challenge, geo expansion, portfolio growth, HA focus, regulatory compliance, or other? And you can check all that apply. Uh, the question again is, rate your biggest challenge, geo expansion, portfolio growth, HA focus, regulatory compliance, or other? And it looks like most of you have voted, so I will close the poll and share the results. There we have it. Uh, we have 33% geo expansion, 26% portfolio growth, 26% HA focus, and 74% regulatory compliance, and 15% at other. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Bindu. Okay, so regulatory compliance seems to win hands down, and I can quite see why that may be so. Um, it's certainly a problem to grapple with uh, all the different uh, regulatory compliances across the world and make sure you're tracking on them. Anyway, to propel label evolution um, is, is my next slide, and currently processes are manual mostly homegrown solutions that are complex. They don't provide for audit trails or version control. It is supposed that infusing technology can propel labeling evolution to the next sphere. To speak on how we can do this, I give you my colleague, Boris. Thank you. And uh, okay, thank you, Bindu, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us in this webinar today. So I'm I'm glad the audience poll came back uh, the way it did, and as Bindu has described some of the challenges as we think about how we actually evolve our operating models around global labeling, we do need to address these uh, issues, our opportunities really, aren't they, of portfolio growth, international expansion, and how we couple that. Um, uh, with technology solutions and manage also the underlying health authority expectations. And over the next few slides, I want to take you through a few of the principles that we uh, at Typhormix think uh, are key to a next generation operating model and some of the platform uh, components that are required for that. So as we talk about principles for next generation labeling operating model, and this is a theme you will see uh, throughout the next few slides, we'll talk about the actual people working within the system, the process that supports it, and the underlying technology. If we look at people, uh, I say that delivery roles and responsibilities need to be based both on knowledge and location. And especially as you start to think about geographic expansion, this becomes uh, very much a reality. Uh, 
a lot of companies, you know, by the nature of the growth cycle, will have most of the labeling done in major markets. We um, seek initial approval either in the European Union or in the U.S. We have uh, a couple big labels, the USPI, the SPC that we have to manage. And it works well with a centralized global mo uh, model. As we branch out and go into uh, new locales, whether it's Asia Pacific, Latin America, we start to see that the knowledge alone to drive the label development here and the management isn't enough, even if it's centrally. But you also will have to have boots on the ground, so to say, at these locations, even if it's within a regional center. Also, what we start to see is that as your workload grows, as the opportunity grows, um, labeling workload, first of all, is highly variable. Uh, times of high activity and, and times of uh, low activity, uh, also coupled with you know very high level strategic content focused work versus operational work. So as we grow, uh, the opportunity is there to evaluate what services can really be successfully externalized versus what do we need to keep internal to be successful. Now there's a whole suite of things that one can think about internal versus external. But again, the key is to manage uh, you know, scale, uh, to be flexible, but to also provide the knowledge at a reasonable cost that's commensurate with the uh, sales of a product worldwide. The process really follows it. And again, you know, as we start to think, and we managed two labels in the past, now we're maybe up to 10, 15. Uh, and as we expand in many different countries, we start to see that our global inwardly based processes may not be um, uh, all that appropriate. And some organizations, as they grow, may have a disconnect even. So aligning these processes globally becomes a big uh, issue. Uh, and then as we have started to see in the EU with the recent EUPV legislation that was passed uh, and put into law is that performance management and your ability to uh, not just track but demonstrate the performance of your labeling process and how quickly you can get safety changes uh, to the market and to the healthcare professional to inform his or her intent to treat becomes very important. But it's not just process. Um, management and performance management, it's also content or qu quality management. And again, here, sort of, you know, how effective your content is, you know, it's not so much a process issue, but it's also a knowledge-based driven issue, and how you measure that becomes key. Now, over the last few years, and I've been in and around labeling for the last uh, 12 years or so, technology has more and more become a part of, of the overall solution set, and Craig will talk a lot more about that. But what we have seen over the last decade is automation. And we should enable automation wherever possible, whether that is related to some of the QA and QC work or you know, the tracking and implementation of changes. But also for the performance management and content control, whether it's structured content authoring uh, to make sure that uh, you know, core data sheets or uh, reference labels are in line with local labels. Uh, and as well as the optimization of process and measurements there. So these are really the principles. This slide then becomes a very busy slide, and it's really just meant to illustrate the totality of what a labeling platform is. Again, we have uh, the people or services side on the top, the processes in the middle, and the technology enablers on the bottom. Now you can see that the technology enabler or the technology stack is fairly large. On the top, you know, running on the x-axis, we have the uh, labeling process the way we see it, you know, which starts with a confirmed safety signal or a new indication or any other update that's required, uh, whether that runs through a CDS or a reference label. Either way, it gets percolated down to the local prescribing information and then ultimately will find its way into the packaging, the artwork, uh, website updates, any kind of other um, distribution of information, and then ultimately onto the truck and to the pharmacy and the patient's home or um, the doctor's office. So on the services side, I think you know we can all see sort of where the end-to-end -end, uh, portions come in. Uh, certainly, we in labeling work mostly you know, on the artwork, uh, sorry, on the labeling content development side. Uh, you know, we're also interfacing a lot with the uh, operations or manufacturing quality teams for regional artwork. 
uh, but then you know we can see that the regional labeling support uh, is something that is key and, and squarely you know usually within the local regulatory team or the legal team of responsibility. As far as you know the processes are concerned, I think I covered most of it. Again, the key performance indicators, quality indicators, and compliance indicators are very important. Uh, at Cyformix, we have developed a suite of these, uh, or a set of these indicators um, to our processes that we feel uh, are ultimately the ones that um, can, can meet the needs for health authorities and, and for companies and sponsors to get the overall feeling off as to performance. Now technology, and again, Craig will talk about this in a bit more detail uh, coming up, becomes a key driver here. Now, we have everything from you know, the workflow management, uh, which is end-to-end, -to, -end, to document repositories, but we also have spot solutions. And spot solutions are those that address one specific step in the process, such as quality assurance or quality control, whether it's side-by-side um, -side comparison of labels and other things, as well as artwork review and approval engines. These things are somewhat outside and often shared also with uh, other departments. So implementation and integration of these into a process becomes key. So this is just the overall labeling platform. Uh, as far as the uh, services, I think I've talked about it. Again, the interesting discussion for, for anybody to have is which part of these are really core um, to my operations and which do I feel comfortable externalizing to a partner. And again, sort of as you think about these sort of things, you know, you will start to see that the, the path of least resistance or the, the low risk approach is, you know, starting with operational work, which is in the second bucket, uh, and then going more towards the content driven side. However, a sponsor always wants to retain control at any time over the content uh, approval. So, you know, and the regional labeling support, again, we have found a lot of the times that um, it's just not feasible for companies to, uh, to set up uh, local affiliates, uh, particularly in uh, Latin America or Asia Pacific, that drive the labeling development. And even if they are affiliate offices in these locales, uh, they are often taxed with other uh, issues in, in regulatory compliance work, quality work, uh, because of the limited resources there that uh, provides an, you know, really uh, the opportunity for, for a partnership there. Uh, now, as we talk about processes, and this is always the interesting discussion to me, um, my, the companies that I have worked at and, and companies I've worked um, with on, on sort of setting up labeling systems, you know, the question becomes how many SOPs do you need, what do you need uh, to ensure regulatory, um, you know, compliance and, and audit readiness, but also, you know, if you look at labeling SOPs and the broader construct of, construct of uh, regulatory SOPs or a quality management system of QMS, both at the regulatory PV and R&D level, how do these become integrated um, is, is key uh, because you will find that as your organization grows and SOPs are uh, created in various silos and, and organizations, uh, the alignment of them becomes key and within labeling even much more particularly as it gets down to health authority interactions uh, and, and other things. Uh, the QHX performance, uh, you know, we've talked about this already. Certainly from a systematic perspective, you need to measure them. They need to be included in your SOPs. Uh, and then you want to have the appropriate training uh, associated with it, along with uh, role clarity. That becomes very important. So, you know, I could talk about this for a lot longer, but you know the reality is, is that you know as labeling you know sort of becomes more complex, as Bindu has said, workload grows, regions expand, and and we we manage labeling globally. The opportunity really gets there for for a different paradigm of doing it. And so this slide is just you know a very high level slide, but from a global centralized model, we need to start to think about how can we actually better utilize you know, technologies where labeling information is more readily available uh, via, you know, a cloud or structured content offering, or how one successfully partners with other organizations in providing labeling services. So, you know, 
how do you know or how do you get to a point where you think you're ready for labeling? It always starts with an assessment and your own need. Uh, I think, you know, it, it depends if you're a smaller company with one or two products, you know, wanting to file in U.S. and EU, or if you're a mid-sized company trying to explore different markets, you know, a tailored solution has to be built for you. Um, and it shouldn't be, you know, necessarily one size fits all. Fits all all the time, but the core components will mostly be there. You know, you want to make sure that when you do implement something, that either within your own organization or, you know, from a partner organization, you do have the right resources to implement that, and that you have appropriate tracking and, um, and management of the life cycle of these. So I'm going to hand it back to Yasmin. We have another audience poll. Thank you for that, Boris. Um, uh, we do have a poll question. And again, you can vote on this by clicking on your screen. And uh, the question is, have you worked with partners to deliver your labels? Yes, no, not sure, but plan to, not sure. The question again is, have you worked with partners to deliver your labels? And it looks like most of you have voted. So I'm just going to close the poll and share the results. And there we have it. We have 56% uh, with yes, 23% no, 8% not sure, but plan to, 13% is not sure. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Boris. Thank you, Jasmine. And I think these are, in, this, these, these are interesting and, expecting, uh, and expected results. Um, you know, most of the folks, and to be honest with you, 10 years ago, we would have never talked about external partnerships and labeling uh, to a large extent, especially on the services realm. But, you know, as, as the um, area and the industry matures, and particularly the processes become much more known, um, this is something that, you know, we'll probably see in the future. So I will hand it over to Craig now for, uh, you know, a review of the technology. Thank you, Boris. And um, I think we have the, uh, the slides being driven for me, so go ahead and advance to the slide. Next slide, please. Or the, uh, there we go. So as Boris was mentioning, um, within the, the new processes and the global environment that we now operate in, there's definitely best practices as far as processes. And as a technology solution provider, our motto and our approach has always been that the process should should drive the implementation and the configuration of the technology that helps aid and automate that process and never the other way around. So this first um, graphic here with the chevrons and the, the documents that I borrowed from, from Boris, if we could advance to the next slide, please. Um, those basically represent uh, the process that is being, that is driving this solution. And as a solution provider, we have out-of-the-box solutions that we can configure to meet the unique um, requirements of the regulatory organization and or the safety organization to deliver those uh, requirements globally. And if we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. And one more time. And again then, please. So let's talk a little bit about the process workflow. Go ahead and advance till we see some graphics. So just as we saw before, that there are documents that come out of this process, we have married together and created applications that are modular and web-based that help power and enable both the partner organization and the uh, pharmaceutical organization to deliver those required documents slash uh, global regulatory compliance needs. And go ahead and advance. In this case, we see two of our applications that drive the actual workflow the process, and the process. These two applications also provide the ability to report and provide transparency on when safety, safety labeling changes, when they are identified, when they are evaluated, the category they should be evaluated in, and then how they propagate out to the markets where they are uh, marketed in. So RMT Portal is a, uh, if you can go back please, yeah. RMT Portal is a request management engine that allows for, um, if Cyformix is using it or if your organization is using it as a partner organization, it allows for those individuals and those resources to capture um, when exactly requests are being made to either uh, update labeling with safety information, update um, the core data sheet with information, and or maybe just a local market label with any information. The importance here is that your organization be able to record 
and provide transparency of when something has, uh, when a request has been made, when was it known, how long did it take to get from point A to, B, to point B, and whether or not that duration falls within your standard operating procedures of acceptable based on the category it's in. The next module, Global Decision Tracking, GDT Portal, is um, the next application in line as far as the process goes. Once a request has been evaluated and determined that it should go into labeling, either into the core data sheet and or into a local market label, um, the, the Global Decision Tracking Engine captures the actual content slash concept that is being implemented into your labeling, whether or not it's made it into the core data sheet, how long it took, which resources were responsible for doing that, and then it also propagates out to the countries slash markets once um, it is determined that it should. Once into the market, the application provides the ability to, Id to identify if deviations occur and or if there are dependencies that exist for that product. And what I'm talking about here is the, uh, a, a very common one where uh, it could be that Ecuador uh, needs to have the U.S. label approved before they can even update their local label and send it to the, um, the Ecuador Health Authority for approval. So those types of relationships are built in to our application, which is then, you know, notifications, alerts, and reminders are sent to the, um, the partner organization that's helping you with your regulatory process so that you know how well you're doing, when things have to happen, if things are on time, if they're late, if there are dependencies being missed, if there are deviations that are happening. And all in all, what it helps with is uh, if all audits ever happen, and those audits do happen from like MHRA, your, your organization can very easily show when a safety update was identified, when that request was determined to move forward into a core data sheet, and then when it moved into the market, and then what deviations, if any, occurred. All of that reporting, transparency, and capabilities are, are within one click using the right technology. So go ahead and uh, advance to the next slide, please. Additionally, as we talk about this process, we just talked about the workflow process and actually moving it through. Well, there's also the process and the capabilities and needs of actually capturing the content of the label and or core data sheet, being able to store that information off in sections and identify um, where it is that a change landed. To date, um, technology really hasn't provided this capability. Right up, to, up till now, it's really been um, individuals that work in either a PDF document or a Word document um, that did not provide the capability on a global level to be able to know that a safety change was made on a certain date and to be able to identify where that safety change ended up in your core data sheet, what sections, and then also what corresponding sections of a local label also um, captured that safety update. It could be one, it could be many. Well, with our, t our capabilities that we offer now, there, are, there is the concept of being able to author in XML um, sections, and we provide that across three different modules, three different applications. Obviously, the SPL portal application, we can go ahead and hit once on the next slide, or just hit once so it advances with some text. The SPL portal application is specific to the U.S. market. Again, the FDA in 2005 um, implemented its uh, um, guidance on XML authoring electronic submissions, which was it utilizes the SPL port or the SPL schema. So we developed an application that allows um, authors to create content of U.S. labeling in a very familiar, familiar format, but it actually stores the data, the sections of that content into a database repository in XML format so that you can identify and um, and manage that data independent of anything else. So again, as I mentioned, if a safety update comes through and it impacts the U.S. label, the user is able to say it was this section of the warning document that provided um, that information and here's where it's captured. The SCA portal is our open XML authoring environment that allows for pharma companies and um, sponsors and partners to author core data sheets and other local labels, and when I say other local labels, I mean outside the United States, that content can still be managed in an XML environment, but it does not have to adhere to the, um, to the same structures and or rules that the uh, U.S. guidance provides for SPL. And then ESM portal is our environment that we use to manage data that gets submitted in XEVM, XEVM PD format to the, EE, to the EMA. Um, that has its own set of rules, regulations, and requirements that it has to adhere to. So 
the combination of all of our products provides for a very powerful platform to be able to drive your process um, in an automated manner, provide transparency, provide um, rules, alerts, reminders, um, and also external capability for your organization and, and for the partners that drive your organization, such as Cyformex. Go ahead and advance, please. Okay. So in summary, what, um, what we'd like to talk a little bit about here is the combination first of the, the, the process. And this is where um, having and leveraging a partner that is very knowledgeable and has the resources um, that are shared across multiple organizations to provide you with the, the highest level of expertise, the highest level of knowledge, and best practices to drive your organization in the most efficient way. That married together with um, very light, very robust, and uh, proven technology solutions will provide you with the best capable solution and partners that will guide you into what we all know as is that um, you know a more electronic, a more robust, and a more and a, a larger growing regulatory needs within the organization? As we know, um, bodies such as the FDA and the EMA, they are only continuing to grow the regulations that impact your pharmaceutical organization, and they also continue to implement uh, electronic submission standards. And as we know, that's only going to continue to grow. So by utilizing an industry. Uh, organizations such as Cyformix that um, see these type of um, growing requirements every day across their their um, customer uh, set, um, you will only benefit more as that continues to grow. And then the technology solutions also provide a lot more efficiency. So with that, we can go to the next slide. And uh, I think this leads us into the Q&A session. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I great. think we have some... Yeah, okay, I think we already you. have some questions that are showing. Yes, we do. Thank you very much, Craig and Bindu and Boris, for that very insightful presentation. Now I would like to invite our audience to continue sending in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've received some questions, so I'll start with those. Uh, the first question is for Craig. Uh, Craig, you talked about Pfizer and Novartis. What does, it, what does this look like in the real world, and uh, can you give us an example? How was it implemented, or uh, what did it look like, and how did the client benefit? All right, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we have, a, like I mentioned, we have some, had some experience um, across the industry, and, and it's been from large to small. Um, Pfizer and Novartis are, you know, actually two examples of probably the larger implementations that, um, that actually go from a safety identification all the way into um, the packages. And what I mean by that is, as most people know, there are a myriad of different drivers as far as um, factors that, det that an organization determines um, at, that a, a labeling update needs to happen. Safety updates are one of those. And I'll just can take that example because I think uh, all organizations have experienced that in some way. But at both of those organizations you mentioned, those safety updates can come in from internal sources. They can come from external sources. And when they do, um, those, those companies actually use our RMT and GDT portal applications to first capture those safety updates, um, categorize them, and identify from those safety updates what is it that they want to put content-wise or concept-wise into their core data sheets and eventually then propagate out into the markets that um, that market that product. So in this example, you know, in this example, what we can say is that a safety update came in. The organization captures the the concepts. And what I mean by concepts is that uh, it might be that health authority um, has come back to one of those companies and said, you know, we've seen from clinical studies and other um, similar products that uh, there there should be uh, an expanded some expanded text in your uh, black box warning or your warnings that talks about pre-existing heart condition in this certain you know. Uh, event happening. So with that, the organization evaluates it, puts it into our application, which then sets it onto a path. Once it's set on a path, the uh, organization knows exactly the steps that need to take place based on their standard, oper standard operating procedures and the associated timeline and resources that will be required. So once you have that, the application can then implement notifications, alerts, reminders, um, which is what happens there. And those come through in the way of either emails and or um, through the application itself, a reminder. So um, 
the automation allows them to identify those those updates, um, put them in a timely manner based on their standard operating procedures into their core data sheet, and then when it's ready to propagate out to the markets, the application um, ties into their existing uh, infrastructure and databases on so it knows what products are marketed in what countries. If your organization does not have a robust um, solution like that, it's actually built into our application also, so you can have it in one or um, one or the other in your own, you know, existing databases or in ours. And then the 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 affiliates slash countries are notified that the uh, core data sheet's been updated, and that it's some time for them to do something. But there is that other event that I talked about, which is the dependency. There are situations where countries have to wait for their sponsor organization. In this case, let's say it's the United States again. So. Those dependent countries should not be put onto a clock or be notified until their reference member state, their reference country, is done with the tasks that have to happen before they could even get started. So again, that's all managed within the application when it's configured, and those notifications happen in a timely manner at the right time. Um, and then when it's all over, so once the point that the uh, the warning information has made it into the product leaflet in that each country, the application can report if ever an audit happens of when was something known, when did you get it into your core data sheet, and when did you get it out to the countries into market, and did that process adhere to your own standard operating procedures and your own timelines that you've defined. And that's all available in uh, canned reports that come out of the solution, and when in the hands of trained individuals like um, the, uh, the users at Cypharmics who, uh, you know, who know our solutions, uh, that's invaluable. They're able to help you then and provide a lot of transparency to your organization, and it frees your organization up to continue to do the regulatory affairs things that, uh, that you need to without having to worry about managing some spreadsheet or whether or not an email came through. Um, the technology uh, allows you to do it, and the individuals that you work with, with at Cypharmics, will, you know, they know exactly how to utilize that and provide that to also help you. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Craig, for that answer. Our next question is okay. for uh, Bindu. Bindu, in your experience, what best practices are out there that have worked for organizations? Can you provide an example to, or two and uh, describe the best ways to implement them, please? Okay, that's your question is on best practices and global labeling. I think that's that's really relevant uh, because labels are a very visible element and they have a direct impact on patient safety. So it is pretty critical that labeling information um, are error-free and they stay up to date. Uh, some of the best practices uh, which allow us to meet expectations from both our end users, the healthcare professionals and regulators are in the areas of um, the kind of information, especially that pertaining to the safe use of the medicine. Then there are some that pertain to the format um, because the information that you provide needs to be both readable and the language needs to be easily understood by anybody that's uh, involved with the supply and use of that medicine. And um, there's also style because there is a potential for um, confusion when there are similar drug names or similarities in uh, packaging. So um, some of the best practices that I can speak to, I think, are uh, the most important one would be to understand and stay abreast of what's happening in, in terms of the global labeling and packaging requirements. In fact, we've, uh, I mentioned this before, we've, we've found it useful to maintain a knowledge repository, which is a ready retina, which, which is constantly updated by our experts. Um, the, the other best practice could be to probably build strategies around uh, meeting all the rule book requirements, as well as space and branding uh, needs. Uh, so, for example, one of the technology tools we were able to implement uh, has a rule book uh, written on it so that uh, the labeling operators actually cannot flout the rule book uh, laid down by regulators. Um, yet another best practice is to, to discover available options 
some some web-based technology, etc., to meet the challenges of global label management across different locations. And and we heard from our audience today that you know regulatory compliance is a big uh, challenge. So. So we've seen successful implementation by some of our partners using the hub and spoke model, for example, uh, regional hubs which are created uh, servicing a certain set of countries that allows the mapping of the local information to the global core data sheet. So um, that's something that's worked for us. Uh, finally, I would say, uh, to, to drive uh, lean, lean methodology and find ways to save both time and money as well as enhance uh, label production accuracy. Uh, this can be done using automation, reducing any manual interventions. So I, I do believe that companies should focus on their core competence and outsource discrete tasks to expert partners. Um, they, they still are able to retain control by continuing to review or approve the labels. Um, one, one more example I can give uh, you is to, uh, is this, is, this is something we did with one of our large pharma clients, uh, was breaking up of the work, um, the complex tasks were broken up into the more administrative work, such as running of labeling meetings, creating decision log, updating the labels with those decisions. Those were um, outsourced to a cost-effective location. And uh, this can be a great starting point, as it was for us. And then we gradually see um, a transfer to the more complex tasks, such as driving the labeling decisions, making recommendations. Um, and, and that's a really nice uh, case study that we've seen um, in, in the evolution of uh, outsourcing of a labeling um, entire labeling operation for, for a large pharma. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Bindu. Our next question is for Boris. Uh, Boris, how can organizations ensure ongoing compliance and risk mitigation when employing managed services? Uh, thank you. That, uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, again, uh, what we have to probably think about what is what compliance are we managing and what are the risks we're trying to mitigate uh, now, what we all want to make sure is we ensure and, and maintain inspection readiness with health insur insurance agencies. Uh, health insur and, and, you know, these inspections go on many different ways, right? They focus on process uh, and making sure that your processes are mature, well-defined, and documented, that roles and responsibilities are clear, not just within your organization, but with anybody you work with. And they want to make sure that content management is handled appropriately. Number one, that your labels are aligned worldwide, specifically to the locale where the inspection has taken place. So very much, you know, um, there has to be within the process steps for version control, um, you know, making sure that documents and e-signatures are, are managed correctly. And that you can answer all these questions and that you have transparency with the vendor that you're working with. Uh, and that there's a flow of communication that, that shows that all of these things are in place. So it, it becomes really a framework around managing risk, but also uh, managing compliance and ensuring it uh, in an ongoing fashion, both through, like I said, clear roles and responsibility, mature processes that are trained on, that are implemented correctly and documented, uh, a framework of communication with a partner uh, that is based on, on mutual recognition and trust of what you're doing. And this way, you know, you can, you can also demonstrate to the agency that you're acting as a whole and, and that you are following, you know, all, you know, CFR, you know, Part 11 regulations and others, and, and that these are incorporated into your system uh, for the U.S., uh, for example. Thank you very much for that, Boris. Uh, the next question is also for you. How do I get started with an outsourcing uh, an outsourcing model, and what's the path what's the path of least disruption? Yeah, good question. Um, how do you get started? Well, it's it's really a question that you have to then ask yourself. What are really my aspirations and my needs? 
uh, why do I actually want an external service or anybody to help me with? Am I, you know, a, a smaller outfit that is looking to expand into another region, so I need some support, you know, in, in another country? Let's say I want to go into Asia Pacific, but my budget doesn't allow me to hire a labeling team there. Uh, or do I, you know, have a large portfolio of existing drugs that, quite frankly, because of my development pipeline, I don't want to manage anymore? So I want somebody else to come in and, from an end-to-end -end perspective, manage that portfolio. So, you know, these are the sort of things, first, you have to ask yourselves, why am I actually doing this? What are my needs? As far as the path of least disruption, again, you know, it depends on your appetite, sort of, and, and, and where, how quickly and where do you want to go. Uh, so one may say that, well, you know, let me try outsourcing or, or you know, a services partner first at a small level and, and have spot solutions from that partner, whether it's, you know, helping me in some of the operational aspects only, so the back office work that focuses on, you know, workflow management, uh, you know, project management more than anything, uh, or, you know, document management. Or, you know, do I want to start immediately engage a partner into more, you know, content-driven things? So at Cyformix, we've worked, you know, on the content side for many years now in developing labels, de novo, or, you know, providing uh, label updates worldwide. And, you know, the sponsor can then maintain control, obviously, over the content. That would alleviate some, a lot of the um, uh, management around drafting, but also team facilitation. So it's really dependent on the organization and what really requiring of, a, of an assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Our next question is also for you. This oh. audience member is asking, um, assigned rules and responsibilities are crucial. Who is responsible for the technical aspects of the labeling companies for example, RA packaging or a separate labeling technical function? Okay, so that's an interesting question and in many ways I guess I could interpret that without having the ability to ask a follow-up question here. I want to just interpret, interpret this as who's responsible actually and how is the uh, artwork side of things managed uh, because I saw packaging in there. And again, this is an interesting phenomenon because, you know, labeling in itself is very much a, a regulatory affairs function, but the instantiation of that label into the actual packaging uh, itself becomes a partnership project. So who actually, you know, sort of owns some of the responsibilities? I have seen various models across different sponsors. Certainly one uh, true thing that always holds is that, you know, the actual content, even for artwork, is provided by the regulatory organization. This may be the global labeling group or the uh, local affiliate office that is more closely related to the, um, uh, to, uh, has more closer insight into uh, labeling regulations. In Europe, for example, you know, um, labels are all the same with the exception of, you know, a, a box that's added for some, for some uh, local variances. Uh, then, but then, you know, once you get into actually putting this onto, um, onto a template and into artwork, that's where it gets uh, differentiated. A lot of the times, either the quality or packaging information is owned the uh, artwork creation, and regulatory will, all, will be part of the review and approval cycle for that. Uh, some regulatory organizations have their own artwork or, you know, and, and, and drafting group um, within themselves. I think the key to all of this, you know, and is that, again, roles and responsibilities obviously are defined. There is no right or wrong model here but also that workload and expectations are managed clearly because uh, we all, you know, if we have worked in labeling, are aware of the uh, ever-changing nature of labels. So the communication between these two groups or three groups or, or whoever it's set up is, is important because, um, as, as we know, as, you know, as changes come around that impact, you know, not just the package insert or the leaflet, but also the uh, package component labeling, vials, vial labels, cartons, you know, changes have a big impact um, downstream and, and can cause, you know, a lot of uh, scrap if you're not careful. So communication and planning is a joint function that usually is led out of regulatory. I hope that answers the question. And if I misinterpret it in any way, so I'm available after this um, webinar, obviously, to, to dive in more deeply into the specifics of this one question if needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boris. Our next question is uh, for Craig and Boris. It is, uh, how do you deal with sending files to vendors and the whole Part 11 version control issue? 
Craig, do you want to take this one? Yeah, go ahead and repeat it, please. It's a, how do you deal with sending files to vendors and the whole Part 11 version control issue? Okay, that's a great question. Um, the applications that we use actually have a uh, they're, they're secure applications that have uh, encryption capabilities and then also u uh, unique user authentication uh, capabilities. Uh, we've had audits where we um, the implementation has been evaluated and has been complied with 21 CFR compliance. But obviously, there's the um, on on the customer side. There's always the need to have the ability to also maintain those same, same level of version control slash you're going to get a copy um, version of a uh, document back and it's um, you know on your side on the customer side there's also the need to still maintain that with with version control on your side also. Thank you, Craig. Boris, do you have any uh, comments for that, or I can move on to the next question? We can move on in the interest of time. Okay. And uh, the next question is also for Craig, and uh, the question is, can the Integraph technical solutions be added onto an existing RIM system, or is it separate? That's a great question. All of our applications um, to date, even when they've been implemented in, internally or behind firewalls of customers, we have the capability of um, pulling information from other systems. So once we have the, the opportunity to talk to the right technical resources, within your organization, there is the opportunity to be able to leverage existing data out of other systems so that we can reutilize it. Absolutely. There's no need and our one of our major tenets is uh, data should never be maintained in two places. Thank you, Craig. We have time for one more question and it's uh, also for you. It is, uh, do you manage or plan to manage develop or develop similar software for devices? Uh, th that question has come up, and when um, when we an analyzed the requirements for um, for devices slash XML submissions, uh, we determined that the market right now does not have it's not um, it does not have enough opportunity for us to make enough uh, revenue on it. So um, there is a solution that um, you know that uh, that is out there that's free that allows for it, and it seems to do a good job. So. From, from the standpoint of what's required for devices, uh, we don't have uh, and didn't have decided not to address that right now. Thank you very much, Craig, and thank you all of you for all these great answers. We have reached the end of the Q&A session for this webinar. If you have any further questions, please direct them to our speakers via email. Their contact information is showing on your screen right now. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Bindu Narang, Director of Scientific Writing and Regulatory Affairs at Cyphermix, Boris Jankowski, Director of Solutions Architecture at Cyphermix, and Craig Troutman, CEO of Intergraph. Thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from XTOX with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participants is appreciated as it will help us improve our future webinars. We hope you found this conference informative and have a great day everyone. <laughs>